If you don't understand why people in Uganda think it's necessary, you won't understand why they think it's a necessity because of what the gay people are supposedly doing. So the conspiracy theory gets inverted here. In other words, because homosexuals have a conspiracy to abduct children in schools and in church and all over the place, and because homosexuality didn't exist in Africa, mm -hmm. and if you believe that, before colonialism, and that the homosexuals now are a post-colonial uh, attempt to recolonize Africa and therefore to defend national sovereignty and the state and the church and God's redemption of Africa, we must stop the homosexuals from abducting and molesting our children. Makes perfect sense, right? Now, here's the trick. While, and unbeknownst to us, Jeff is writing this book, one of the people where I used to work, Kapi Akayoma, a black, straight, African Episcopal priest says, what are these people doing over there? And he goes over there. And he interviews people with his little telephone camera saying these things about why they have to execute all the homosexuals. And then he comes back and starts writing a report. And then everyone starts denying what Jeff is saying. And Kapi is going, I have it on my camera. <laughs> so suddenly there's evidence that everything that Jeff was saying was true. And we all start to talk to each other. Because it turns out the impetus for this bill comes from the United States Christian right. And it was exported over there in language that was then attributed to black African Episcopals who then sent it back to the US where white uh, evangelical churches raised money to stop the homosexual conspiracy in Africa, which was invented by white evangelicals in this country. Nice move. So, you know, all of a sudden you start getting into this argument about, you know, what uh, Obama and post colonialism and what's that all about? It has to do with understanding that Africa is a really big place. It is a very important place we tend to not pay attention to. And if you want to stop the spread of ra rationality and the evangelical movement in Africa, um, what you need to do is come up with a counter subversive panic. And that's what I'm going to talk about, counter-subversive panics as conspiracies, conspiracy theories. So that if you want to stop enlightenment principles and sexual equality in Africa, you have to come up with something that's even scarier than your last panic. And homosexuals abducting your children is a pretty good one. It's worked for decades all over the world. Um, to understand how all this works, you have to read Tim LaHaye. I don't recommend it. I do. Uh, the Battle for the Mind uh, comes out quite a few years ago before he is the co-author of the Left Behind series. So I want to talk about that the idea of conspiracy theory as a worldview that is you know, non-rational and is not amenable to a discussion of rational argumentation. I want to very much agree <laughs> with uh, the idea that you the point here is not to argue that what these people think is wrong. The point here is to figure out where is the wedge point in American society right now to divide their power away from not just atheists and secularists, but the mainstream of Christian and Jewish and even Muslims religious belief. And that's where the wedge is. People who may have a religious belief, but accept that secular people can be moral and that separation of church and state needs to be defended. That's the wedge point. If you want, I totally understand that 90% of you think religion is bogus, and I get that, and I, I honor your belief in that, but as an organizer, if you're gonna organize a country where 80% of the country believes in some spiritual or religious faith, that as an organizer, it's a losing game, and you're gonna to have to pick your battles. And that's the point of talking about why some of these people are never going to change their mind. There is in America a switch voting group of Christians who vote Democratic and Republican, who will stand up for separation of church and state in some elections and not in others. And they, they are a swing vote that's very, very important to understand. 15% of the voters in this country come out of the Christian right, and most of them believe, and this is from exit polling, most of them believe in a vast secular humanist conspiracy. So I want to thank the, the Center for Inquiry uh, for inviting me. I noticed that it has in its logo the flame of eternal truth, which, of course, it gets from the Manichaeans and the Zoroastrians. So it's always good to have a little irony. Uh, I, too, was an Eagle Scout. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I, I am still a Christian, hard to believe but true, who uh, thinks that secularists were protected under the Constitution by a group of deists who couldn't agree on what God was, and therefore to try and interpret um, uh, the idea of a godly society by the way it's put forward by the folks from the American Family Association or Tony Perkins at the Family Research Council, it's a very bad idea. Um, how did we get to the point where secularism is the main enemy, as Mr. Shook pointed out? That was a departure from the old main enemy, which was communism. Communism for 50 years held together Christian right organizing. The Christian right did not occur after Jimmy Carter. The Christian right's been around for quite a long time, at certainly as early as the Scopes trial. And in fact, before that, with the entire invention of the idea of fundamentalism, which only took place around 1915 in terms of codifying a sort of a schismatic set of principles that every Christian had to believe. Up until that point, that was um, not something that happened within Protestantism very much. There were, people would splinter into different Protestant denominations, but there was no assertion that there was one set of Christian beliefs outside of certain codes um, that people would recite in church but pay very little attention to. Um, how did this work? Well, a number of things happened. Uh, one was that uh, there was a series of, how did the new right get reinvolved in asserting themselves into taking power or taking dominion? So I'm gonna talk about what is dominionism for a few minutes and then switch to why is dominionism motivated by their conspiracy theory. Dominionism is just the idea that Christians are mandated by Genesis to take dominion over all aspects of secular society as well as nature, okay? And it comes from a struggle within Christianity and primarily Protestantism, primarily Calvinist Protestantism, where a group of people who talk basically about uh, the older Calvinist ideas, not just of the elect, but you know, uh, a whole set of, of principles by which we would be the shining city on a hill, now, how many people know what the shining city on the hill of the beacon? That was a Protestant theocracy that was patriarchal and executed heretics. So when people want to talk about history, let's be clear that the shining beacon on a hill executed its heretics and, and basically it was heteropatriarchal. So I'm not, I'm not thinking it was such a great idea. But the basic idea that develops from that early Puritan and, and um, uh, those heritages is that America is the fruition of biblical prophecy and that American political and religious leaders are in a, a, an alliance to bring the reality of biblical prophecy through the United States. We are the redeemer nation. There are all sorts of code words you hear in political speeches from people in the Christian right. Uh, you hear them talking about uh, up against the principalities and powers. What does that mean? A nice phrase, sounds very poetic, you know, written by King James, who was probably gay, but they don't care about that. Uh, the whole idea here is that the principalities and powers are the works of Satan, so that if you're suggesting your enemy in the Democratic Party or a liberal or a secular humanist is involved with the principalities and powers, they're saying you work with the devil. But if you don't know that, you just hear it, you just think they're using interesting language. But if you're part of the group of people who read the Bible every week, you know that these are allusions to this is a struggle between absolute good and absolute evil, which was known as the Manichaean heresy. But we won't go there today. Um, Manichaeans, truth, light, dark, right, anyway, flame, go look it up. The whole idea of the Christian right today is that secular, atheistic, godless humanists have taken God out of America and that destroys the covenant with God that America represents. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you're a Calvinist or you're a doctrinal conservative Lutheran or if you believe in the rapture or not, if you're post-millennial, pre-millennial, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, doesn't matter. God wants you to take dominion, and it's important to do it now because we see all around us the evidence that we are in a moral society that has lost its attachment to God, and this has to be stopped. The evidence is everywhere. We teach evolution. We allow gay people to get married. There are earthquakes. 
Oh, where'd that come from? Okay, so, little sidebar. You need to understand all of the things in the book of Revelation, because if you are a Bible-believing fundamentalist, you don't read the Bible like most Christians in America in mainstream denominations do as a kind of guide to thinking about things. You read it as a script with a timetable. And like all apocalyptic beliefs, time is running out. And as we approach the apocalypse, which is the confrontation between good and evil, through which hidden truths will be revealed and the world will be set right, there are tests. And there are tests. Now, you may ask, as I once did, if you believe in the rapture, and if you believe in the pre-trib rapture, it means you're raptured up before the shit hits the fan, biblical term, um, <laughs> why bother getting involved in politics? It's a perfectly good question. And for a long time, it was a stumper. And people had said, would say, after the Scopes trial, evangelicals and fundamentalists said, if we get too involved in politics, we will become soiled with this reality rather the reality of our work with God. And so for many decades, the idea of many of these folks was you would read the Bible, you would go to church, you would raise your family, you'd be upstanding in the community. But until about 1976, you couldn't predict their voting based on their demographic in terms of Republican or Democrat. Now who knows what happened in 1976? Billy Carter said he was born again since the Scopes trial, the first presidential candidate to admit to be an evangelical. Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter. Sorry, Jim, who did I say? Billy Carter, yeah, sorry. Jimmy Carter, Jimmy, not Billy. Yeah, he was even crazier. Um, the peanut people. So he comes out of Plains, Georgia, and his peanut farm. He says he's evangelical. He gets into Playboy talking about, you know, sin in his heart, which is kind of an interesting dilemma for people who we're Bible believers. But millions of voters come to the poll to vote for Jimmy Carter, who in fact draws people who hadn't voted for years, as well as draws um, some Republicans who had not previously thought about voting Democrat, voted for Jimmy Carter because he had declared himself born again. Who sees this? An interesting group of people, Christian right organizers, and economic libertarians from the right who believe in a particular form of laissez-faire capitalism. And they form a coalition, and they call it, they don't call it the new right, it becomes the new right. But what happens is a group of organizers approach Jerry Falwell and say, let's start something to push, you know, if, if the Democrats can bring all these people to the polls, then we can do better, and they did. And they formed the moral majority, they assigned that to Jerry Falwell. Everyone thinks this was all about abortion, and that was the topic they picked. But it turns out Randall Balmer, a religious studies scholar, went and asked a few years ago, and they said, well, we, you know, it turns out, if you look at the demographic studies, Roe v. Wade, what, 73, did not mobilize Protestants to get involved in the abortion move, anti-abortion movement, which till that point had been almost all Catholic. It was in fact a series of films by Francis Schaeffer, a theologian, and which starred uh, and a relatively unknown neonatal intensive uh, care surgeon from Philadelphia, C. Everett Koop, which were shown in evangelical Protestant churches all over America. And suddenly there was a challenge within Protestantism to address abortion as a moral sin. And it was equated in this wonderful film by Francis' son, uh, son Frankie, um, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, and they said that abortion was equivalent to the Holocaust and slavery, and that if secular humanism was allowed to take over America, that eventually we'd be killing the deformed young people and killing old people, which is why the death panels resonated with millions of Americans because they had been hearing that threat for 20, 30 years. So as crazy and stupid as they sound, one, they have stories that, is the, that are their reality that are very deeply ingrained, and two, there is not a shred of social science evidence that shows that people who believe these things are less intelligent or more crazy than their neighbors. Now, this varies from around the country, but the demographic remains relatively the same. 
that they, people who believe these things, who are fundamentalists and, and evangelical Christians who believe in these ideas, are very much similar to their neighbors in every dimension, except that they go to church more often. If you go to church more than twice a week, you're more likely to vote conservative Republican. That's, that's the single greatest predictor, in fact, of that, interestingly enough. Um, how much you're involved in the social and as, as well as spiritual life of your church. Um, so, you have to take dominion. Why do you have to take dominion? Because secular humanism is a conspiracy. Why? Because Tim LaHaye says so, and so do hundreds of other pastors and uh, religious writers from the Christian right. The battle for the mind, uh, the battle for the family, the battle for the public schools. It's one after another. It starts out as an anti-communist conspiracy theory. Here's the flyer that's put out about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King at a communist training school. It was the Highlander Center where I've been on strategy meetings. Um, it was the communist conspiracy originally. But what happens is just as you start to have all these Supreme Court decisions and these films about abortion and Jimmy Carter is drawing votes to the polls, um, you start to have the Carter Justice Department sending out notes to segregated white Christian academies telling them that if they can't prove that they're um, not really segregated on purpose, they're going to lose their tax-exempt status, which means that the people who pay tuition can't deduct it as a religious donation, essentially, or, or a nonprofit donation. Uh, so Randall Balmer asks the founders of the Christian right, so how'd you do it? How'd you get so many people to come to Washington and go get active around the country? And they said, well, we tried everything. We even tried abortion. Didn't work. But once those schools were threatened, we had people calling us up asking what they could do. So you have both a race and gender subtext to what looks like a religious and political struggle. This makes it harder to unravel because it's not just religion, it's not just politics, it's also race and gender. This is a pretty deep package to untangle. Now, what motivates them? Well, if we're part of a giant secular humanist conspiracy, of course they should take over because that's going to protect America. It's, it's kind of like the glue was anti-communism. And people like Marsden, who's a religious scholar, says that this new secular humanist boogeyman allowed people then to build a much broader and more believable argument for the conspiracy than Soviet agents everywhere. And when the Soviet Union collapses, you already have a new frame. They didn't have to change their frame. They already had the new frame, which was secular humanist atheism, the bugaboo. Now, what are you guys supposedly doing? Well, you could go to the Values Voter Summit last week like Barry and I did, and always an exciting experience. And here Brian Fisher say, quote, not a single one of our unalienable rights will be safe in the hands of a president who believes that we evolved from slime and we are the descendants of apes and baboons. That's his actual quote from the Values Voter Summit. So they believe that teaching evolution morally degrades the society and threatens national security. I don't get it either, but they really believe it. They say that teaching evolution threatens our national security. Gay marriage, don't ask, don't tell, being repealed, threatens our national security. They said these things up at the podium. I'm not inventing this. Uh, part of what I do is I transcribe some of these speeches and write about it because no one really said, did they really say that? Yeah, they really did. And uh, Americans United has posted this. Uh, uh, people from the American Way have posted this. The, the, these, these are actual beliefs. Um, we heard about the Louisiana contingent, Tony Perkins working with Bobby Jindal. Tony Perkins, of course, is the orchestrator of the Values Voter Summit that was here. Uh, Jindal and, and a whole range of Republican candidates spoke at the event. Uh, you look at the Discovery Institute, which works with Focus on the Family, which has the state family councils, which spawn the Family Research Council, which Tony Perkins runs. They have what's called in sociology a dense network. They have state, national, they have denominational, they have all kinds of meetings, they have their own media, they have their own blog sites. This is a very well-organized group that works together. Um, about 15% of the voters, when they leave the polls, say they're part of the Christian right. Probably 20 to 40% are relatively conservative 
evangelicals, uh, probably around five to 10% of Bible, of Christian evangelicals in the broadest sense um, will sometimes vote on a swing vote kind of pattern because of what they see as issues of morality. Morality is not just gay rights and abortion. Morality at various times when Democrats actually have a program they can articulate can include helping the poor, stopping war, uh, even stewardship over the ecology. There are a number of reasons why people will vote for more progressive ideas, even if they are deeply embedded in Christian evangelical culture. It depends on what they define as morality. Now, does this matter outside this 15 to 20 percent? Well, uh, it's hard to know where these overlapping forces are. The Tea Party movement starts out libertarian, it is now 35 to 40 percent Christian right activists and Christian evangelicals who were previously involved in Republican Party politics. So the Tea Party, no matter, it starts out as astroturf, it becomes libertarian little pockets, and as a mass movement, it is essentially the Christian right being re reorganized. So it's important to know that that is in play as well. Birthers, right? Okay, September 2009 poll. Obama, not born in the US. 33% of Republicans say, that's right, he wasn't. Excuse me, let me read that again. You know, the guy who did this poll publicly put a note up saying, I had to check these numbers twice. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, 33% uh, of Republicans in New Jersey either are convinced or suspect that Obama in 2009 was not born in the US. 21% of all voters and that's the scary part, is that some of these beliefs have escaped the Christian right and devoted conservative Republicans to a much broader sector of society who probably tend to vote Republican but are outside of these normal organizing channels. And so there's a bigger constituency for these set of beliefs than you can think. Uh, Tennessee, different poll, not eligible to be president, show me the birth certificate. 34 percent of all voters in Tennessee uh, a few years ago thought Obama was not eligible to be president, 47% of the Republican voters. Um, where do these ideas come from? Bad medicine, socialist me medical care is bad medical care. What year do you think this pamphlet came out? <coughs> Ah, oh, 1971, John Burt Society. The idea that collectivism and socialized medicine is part of the godless communist plan is deeply embedded in this culture. Um, so we have two themes. Obama is a socialist and a fascist. Okay, I know you all think that's pretty zany if you know anything about political science or history. It's also the theory of Friedrich von Hayek, a Nobel Prize winning economist who was a favorite of Ronald Reagan uh, and his sidekick, Ludwig von Mises, who worked with the John Birch Society. And Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, is on the library shelf of most right-wing conservative Christians, along with the works of Schaefer, the guy who talked about, um, you know, the, whatever happened to the human race. So they then develop a whole set of experts that they believe and they can point to. Oh, you don't think they're going to unplug grandma? Read this book by Francis Schaefer. My parents had it on their shelf. Uh, so they have a whole dense uh, set of information to prove this stuff. Conspiracy theories are essentially a narrative form of scapegoating. A conspiracy theory allows you to say, my experts are right, the people I believe in are right, and those people are lying because they're part of a conspiracy. And they're what's, st they're at everything that's wrong in my life, my community, my job, the nation, the world, everything is part of this bad conspiracy. And all we have to do is stop this conspiracy and everything will be fine. Now, A, that's not true. Uh, but number two, it allows you to displace and project all your anxiety towards this unknowable, evil, deeply disgusting other, which also fits into the apocalyptic framework of time running out because time is running out because these people are so mobilized. We're so mobilized, right? Oh uh, my God, you know, if they only knew. Um, the, this evil enemy is so mobilized and so perched on, on a cliff ready to jump down on us and destroy our nation and our relationship to God that we have to act first. And the way we do this is to build the counter conspiracy. And that's what's called a counter subversion panic. If you convince enough people 
that this evil other is about to strike, it justifies resisting them by any means necessary. And if you believe this is the will of God, as sociology of religion expert Brenda Brasher points out, you don't compromise because you must not compromise with evil. Therefore, no matter what bill is put forward in Congress, if you have enough people elected to public office who know that that's how their constituents view the world, they don't want to compromise because there is no compromise with Satan. And that's us. <laughs> okay, so if that's your belief then, you know, it's an us or them, it's, a, it's Manichaeanism again. So how do we operationalize this? Dualism, scapegoating, demonization, and what I call apocalyptic aggression, which is the idea if time is running out, we have to act first to stop them from, you know, playing the uh, evil option they have in plan for us. There are three, three key storylines. It's the Freemasons and the Illuminati, starts in the 1790s. It's the plutocrats and the banksters, that's the late 1800s. As the, as the People's Party starts to collapse, it starts getting more and more into this kind of conspiracy thinking about the plutocrats and the bankersters. I'm not saying there weren't plutocrats and banksters, I'm just saying you could have a rational approach to dealing with organized wealth or you could start writing these crazy novels about the octopus and stuff like that. And then finally, coming out of both of those movements, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, the archetypic great hoax conspiracy document, which essentially says that um, a bunch of rabbis meeting in Switzerland apparently control the world. And if you don't believe me, you can read the American Free Press, recommended by friends of Ron Paul, who will tell you it's the Bilderbergers and this is the secret group behind everything. Um, even though if you actually read people who study power elites like C. Wright Mills or Holly Sklar or my friend G. William Domhoff, they will say, these national, international organizations don't have power themselves. They invite people with power to talk about how they're going to keep their power. That makes perfect sense. That's actually not a conspiracy. That's very wealthy people organizing in their own self-interest with very important politicians who want to keep money flowing into their pockets from the very wealthy people. Um, people say, oh, the Trilateral Commission, it's a conspiracy. They publish everything, they, they write their stuff up, they publish it. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, they put out books and pamphlets. So a conspiracy story of the, uh, alleging how power is exercised is a way of not having to deal with complexity and ambiguity. And people who believe in conspiracy theories as the way the world works cannot tolerate ambiguity and they must have closure. If, in fact, a piece of the puzzle is missing, as far as they're concerned, that story doesn't make any sense. So they start looking for the absolute truth about 9-11 or the Kennedy assassination or whatever. And they can find it because you can always find one thing that doesn't fit. I work as an investigator for attorneys for years. I never did an investigation where I thought I found 100% of everything. And I, it's just absurd. You never, if you're seriously doing it, being a journalist, you never think you have the complete story. If you do, you're not being a good journalist. Um, Satan, well, Tim LaHaye, okay. <laughs> Tim LaHaye has written that the crafty election of Franklin D. Roosevelt as president, that's a quote, uh, was part of a secret conspiracy, quote, to turn the American Constitution upside down. Ready? to use our freedoms to promote pornography, homosexuality, and morality, and a host of evils characteristic of the last days. Again, an apocalyptic reference. So this kind of struggle then is not just metaphysical, but it is a struggle between the future of the world. It, it is a struggle that determines the future of the world, whether it will be a godly future or in the hands of us satanic agents. Um, the most recent version of this is called cultural Marxism, that's the theory, uh, in, in, in terms of moving away from just secular atheistic humanism because relatively small in numbers, uh, to a much larger idea that all liberalism, all the Democratic Party is infused with this idea of cultural Marxism, which is multiculturalism, which believes in political correctness, which then allows uh, Mr. Brevik in Norway to shoot all those people and blow up buildings, because as he wrote in his own manifesto, cultural Marxism is what allows politicians 
to tolerate the influx of Muslims into Norway, which is destroying Western Christian culture. And so essentially, it all comes down to this idea of Western Christian culture, a very hierarchical, a very male-dominated, heterosexual, white, European view of how the world should work. And even within Christianity that's conservative, there's an awareness that this is iffy. So you have things like the promise keepers, where men go to, white men go to black men and say, you can pray with us as long as we both keep women subordinate. Great deal, don't you think? Anyway, it's very clever. Uh, real power, I'm gonna end with these. The real power behind communism. You have a picture of Lenin in front and Satan in back. My, fam my favorite, communism, hypnotism, and the Beatles. It's all a cultural <laughs> plot, okay? Really, gotta love it. And um, New American John Birch Society, waking up to world currency. This is so not marginal that in Congress, people introduced a resolution saying that the president, and this was Bush, the president could not merge Mexico and Canada into a North American Union and issue new currency. That was like, come on, no one planned that. Anyway, so I actually have some of these because somebody went and minted the Amero, like the Euro, so you can, they're collector's items now. It, situation, this is the basic theory of sociology. Situations that are defined as real are real in their consequences. If you believe there's a secular humanist conspiracy to destroy America, it is your duty to mobilize a counter-subversive project. And that is how these folks see themselves. It is unlikely you will convince 15% of the American population that you are really not agents of Satan. How are you gonna prove it? Let them feel for bumps? I don't think so. So you then really have to decide what several people here have suggested, that there's a much larger viable coalition of people who want to preserve separation of church and state, that want to defend the Constitution, that want to keep these kinds of pluralistic conversations going in America, and that that group of people will cross a cut across all kinds of different philosophical points of view and political parties. And if we're gonna be able to keep having a conversation about whether there's a God or not, we first have to defend the right of people to have their constitutional protections to freedom of speech and freedom of religion adjudicated in a way that really embraces what the founders, as flawed as they were, intended, and not a very bizarre, narrow view uh, basically pushed upon us by a handful of zealots who even most Christians find irritating. Thank you.